Welcome to this edition of Technology Frustrations and Gimmicks. I'm your host, Aaron Moss, with over 20 years of computer, IT, and office technology experience on your side exposing technical frustrations and money-saving gimmicks in the tech marketplace in broken down layman's terms. The Technology Frustration and Gimmick Show is sponsored by Computer Doctor of Tucson, where we fix the most difficult technical problems on laptops, desktops, of all manufacturers, including Apple products. And now, let's get started. Today's topic on the Technology Frustration and Gimmick Show is the necessary evil of buying internet service. So what gave me the idea of having this show in the first place was uh, I actually have a next door neighbor. She's a sweet lady. She's been a friend of the family for many, many years, friend of my grandmother's, uh, probably decades and decades of friendship. Uh, she asked me, well, she knows that I do computers, so she asked me uh, how she could get internet at her house for a reasonable price. She wanted to watch some Bible videos from a website, uh, and these videos were could be streamed, they could be downloaded onto a device or a tablet. So, now, I've known her for some time. Now, I know that she didn't already have internet so I know she was starting from like no internet to some internet so I was trying to figure out what I should exactly I should tell her without f making her feel too overwhelmed because there are so many choices out there when it comes to internet service so uh, in the process of me answering her question I'll tell you exactly how I answered her question a little bit later on in the show but in the process of me doing this, I realized how monopolized and how unfair buying internet service can be. Uh, at the same time, I realized how more necessary and how more valuable the internet is becoming as time goes on. It's not something as it used to be something of a luxury, but now it's something that we actually are starting to actually need in every household. Now, one of the things that you want to remember is uh, anytime you have something of this type of commodity where there is a, a, a definite need and an obvious uh, a desire for someone to have this service, there's always going to be the, the possibility of these gimmicks, these sales pitches, these uh, getting things for more and you getting less. We've all seen the commercial of, of that airline uh, you know, commercial with the websites where you get the better prices for airline tickets. So they give you this, uh, we, we've seen the commercial, we, you know, they, they, sh they show one person sitting in one seat inside the airplane and the other guy sitting right next to him, you know, the bubble over their head said, this guy only paid $100 for his seat and this guy paid $500 for his seat. You see, so you can be getting something of, of the very, very same service, okay, same airplane, same destination, same airport, same everything, but one person, for some reason, is paying a very, very different price than someone else getting that exact same service. So uh, we're going to talk about the different ways and things that affect the pricing also. So uh, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that there are seven different in types of internet services? For example, there's DSL and cable. So uh, DSL uh, actually runs off of, your, off of your phone line. So the old phone lines, the copper uh, wire that comes into your house from the telephone poles outside of your house uh, or your building, uh, you can actually run internet through those uh, telephones. Now, uh, the speed is somewhat limited, but what the phone company does is they double, quadruple, and even septuple, if that's a word, or they run multiple uh, uh, wires into your house to uh, get the right speed. So there are some DSL companies that are bragging that they have a 40 megabit speed. And the reason why they're able to do this is they're able to cascade or uh, double up on the copper that's running through a wire. So the, 
then in the end they can split the wire into several different ways to uh, to split the signal so that each of their subscribers can get a certain speed when only a certain amount of data is going through the wire in that leg or that branch of of that distribution of the internet. So that's DSL. Uh, the next type of uh, internet that is possible to get your uh, hands on is cable internet. And uh, cable is what I personally have. I have it at my office. I have it at my home. Uh, most businesses that are serious about uh, getting their uh, data, they will ultimately, you'll understand that they are using a cable internet connection. Uh, cable internet is exactly what it sounds like. It runs to the old style uh, coaxial cable that comes into your house that was formerly used for cable TV. You could actually run internet through there. And the internet that you get through there it can be somewhere in the ballpark of uh, 100 or 150 times faster than you know dial-up, which is another type of uh, internet service. So uh, cable is the fastest option. It is the fastest type of internet that is available. It's the fastest uh, thing that you can get in, uh, coming into your house or to your business. If you want the fastest connection, go with cable if at all possible. Now that's DSL and cable. So there are five other alternatives and we're going to go over th through some of these. Some of these you may have heard of before. Uh, one alternative is radio tower internet. And radio tower, uh, if, if you're in a wide level or plain part of your city or town, you may see these very, very tall radio towers. Some of these towers, they're being, <clears throat> their, their uses are being changed. They used to broadcast radio signals, and maybe some of them do, but they have multi-use uh, 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 services. Sometimes they put cell phone towers uh, somewhere in the middle of those radio towers, but a little bit further up, they may also put internet uh, 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 beam uh, uh, signaling so that uh, people in that general area can receive internet almost like a really, really powerful Wi-Fi router, if you will. And some of these uh, radio tower type internet services, uh, a good example for this is, for example, Simply Bits which is a service that is run here in Arizona. So uh, a service like Simply Bits, they establish an internet connection on a radio tower, they put some sort of transmitter on a radio tower, and then within a certain uh, bandwidth or a certain uh, diameter uh, across, it is able to uh, supply internet service to uh, to several neighborhoods within within, I believe, the it's about like a five mile radius it might even be more i didn't really look up the information that much but it's it's very local it's it doesn't cover an entire city per se but uh but a but a pretty large portion of a section of a city uh some of the larger cities can probably be you know maybe a dozen of these towers can cover an entire city so uh your internet could be through there uh the next type of uh, internet uh, connectivity could be mobile tethering. Now mobile tethering is uh, where you get your internet through your cell phone service. So your incoming cell phone signals, cell, uh, phones these days are able to pick up both uh, voice, uh, uh, like, like phone service, texting service, and you could even get a third service of data. So when you're on a smartphone or even just an old style flip phone, it's possible to look at the internet on the phone itself. But think of the phone as just the, as, as receiving data from the cell phone towers. After they receive the cell phone towers, there is a feature in some phones, and this is true of more of the more uh, newer phones that do this, when the phone when the data signal comes off the cell phone towers the phone has the ability to rebroadcast that data signal into a wi-fi signal 
or a corded signal with a cable that you can connect directly from the phone into maybe another device, a laptop or or I or a tablet or something like that and it can actually supply an internet connection to another device another laptop another uh, uh, a computer of some sort and it can receive its internet through the phone and the phone is just acting like a like a pseudo router and uh, other devices can connect to the phone for their internet connection and that is called mobile tethering now, I do want to say this uh, mobile tethering, uh, although it you are connecting to the internet, it is very, very unstable at this point, especially in the four generation. There's been some talk about a fifth generation that's available in you know, uh, uh, other parts of the world, maybe China or, or Japan, where they, they, they actually have some of these services running. And 5G, I'm told... And I, and with the articles that I've read, is absolutely amazing. The uh, 5G technology, it, it is just light years, uh, uh, speed wise, ahead of 4G. And uh, 4G just stands. It's nothing technical about 4G. It just stands for the fourth generation, uh, which is just a level of technology as as things are. Because we had. 2G, 3G, we have four, we're up to 4G now is the most popular. And as 5G starts to become more and more uh, popular, we'll start to see new phones being uh, 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 manufactured that support 4G, new towers that would need to uh, support 5G, and also uh, the subscription plans that cell phone companies offer would also need to support 5G as well. So that that's a that's a really large project to upgrade with the mobile services industry. So that's mobile tethering. Next we have uh, inter satellite internet. So satellite internet is where you're in the middle of nowhere. You have a house or some sort of facility that has uh, very little access or barely uh, phone service. You need it's, it's like you would need something better than DSL but there's no cable service or anything running and and uh, the radio towers do doesn't give you the speed that you need. The next best thing actually would be satellite internet. Now satellite internet, uh, now I live in Arizona so there is a company called uh, Hughes uh, Internet. Uh, Hughes Internet, they offer uh, internet service through the satellite they they give you a dish that points straight up on your roof and the signal coat comes down through a cable and into a router into the building and then from that router it uh, gets dispersed either wirelessly or through wired or however you want to distribute it in the building now the problem with uh, having something on satellite is that when you connect, although the speed, they'll, they'll tell you that the speed could be like 30 megabits or even 50 megabits, but the problem with it, it is, it is a lagged speed. And what that means is, if you were to uh, connect a, an IP phone, for example, on that, there would be like a three second delay. Now the speed is there, but it's traveling an incredible distance to the satellite to get those requests and for it to come back. Those, just due to the to the speed or the I should say the distance that those uh, that those signals have to travel directly to the satellites, you're going to get this three second lag, or sometimes it can be, uh, you know more than three seconds not so bad as maybe 10 seconds 10 seconds 10 seconds is is you know worst case scenario but expect a three second lag and now that that, that may not uh, affect you if you're like watching a Netflix movie and you just need to connect that just means it's going to connect you just have to wait an extra three seconds in order for the movie to get going which is no big deal but if you're on a phone and you say hello it's going to take three seconds for the other person to hear that hello. And when they say hello back, it's going to take another three seconds. So that's a total of six seconds for someone to get back to you. That can be a little bit uh, disturbing. So uh, those are some of the, uh, the, that's the big drawback with a satellite. The download speed might be decent, 
Uh, they usually don't offer much upload speed. So if you're running like a, a security system, I actually have a customer who has satellite and uh, he's running a security system in his building and he has an incredibly difficult time uh, making the uh, keeping the uh, the the live view of the security cameras up because of the upload speed of the satellite internet. So uh, a little ju just to just to quantify that statement, uh, internet service is is a two way highway. There's download and there's upload. Download is how fast things come in. Upload is how fast things go out. Now, if you think of a security system, think of maybe six security cameras, okay? If you want to view what those six security cameras are seeing from some other location, some way, somehow, that video feed has got to leave that building at such a speed and at such a rate so that it can be downloaded and viewed someplace else. So although the download is good, from that uh, security system, you would need a good upload speed in order to upload it out to, the, to a server or to a cloud or s wherever it's going to be viewed from. And then the connection that goes to that cloud or to that server to view it needs to have a good download speed because at that point they would be uh, requesting the information and then the data would be going out to them on a on a download speed so those are some very very uh, important things to know when considering so there's there's download and upload uh, the next type of uh, internet uh, type that you can use is dial-up now dial-up is is uh, many of us can remember that's when you you connect to the internet and you hear that fax sound yeah you know that, that that type of thing so that's what dial up is and that's when you're actually just have just a regular phone landline remember those okay so if you have a regular landline analog line so like when you pick up the uh, uh, the head the, the handset and you hear that dial tone okay those are the types of phones where you can actually plug a phone line into your computer if it actually still has a phone jack. You could actually uh, subscribe to a dial-up service um, uh, in, the, in the settings of the computer and you can actually program the computer to actually dial a phone number, wait for a connection, connect like a fax machine, and then it'll put you online but bear in mind, it's going to take like 30 seconds to download a picture. It's going to take about, you know, somewhere between 20 seconds to a minute to download an entire website. It's extremely slow. Uh, these types of services are still, you know, are still being used in like uh, third world countries where the Internet hasn't really made a grand appearance yet. Um, it's available in areas where uh, other forms of Internet are just not available. Dial up is like a last resort uh, when you have nothing else. Uh, the last one is uh, sort of like a, a Google project. I, uh, I'm calling it the balloon internet. And balloon internet, if you look it up on Google, look up some pictures, you actually see these hot air looking type balloons that are kind of hovering maybe about uh, 5,000, 10,000 feet up. Uh, maybe not that high, but, uh, you know, somewhere, uh, somewhere, uh, between the ground and the clouds, right? Uh, actual clouds, not like digital clouds or something like saved in a cloud, but the actual clouds, you know what I mean? So these balloons, they kind of hover there and what they're doing is they're carrying a signal from a data center. So they have a data center building and then they um, float these balloons uh, out to these uh, out to these locations where the balloons are hovering and the balloons are strategically uh, placed and at the and it's not the balloons that are creating the internet but the balloons are basically uh, carrying high uh, uh, high performance routers okay and they are 
broadcasting downward a Wi-Fi signal for uh, people to connect to. So it's a it's a it's a way to distribute uh, an internet connection from a from a hub building or a hub source. Okay, that signal gets uh, beamed up to the balloons, and then the balloon, I should say, the routers that are on the balloons rebroadcast them downward uh, toward uh, the various subscribers. Uh, Google was trying to make that into like a public internet where they would be, uh, where they would uh, not only uh, uh, be ruling the have the, the world's greatest maps, the world's greatest search engine, the world's greatest uh, advertising, they would now be the source of internet service. So that, that was a project. They actually uh, did had some success in it in uh, Puerto Rico when Puerto Rico had their uh, large uh, 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 storm that uh, pretty much destroyed the entire area. Uh, Google came in with these uh, internet balloons. Now, here is, uh, those are the types of internets that are available out there, but you really want to start thinking about what kind of connection will work for you. Now, um, you really have to think about what kind of user you are. Now, to, uh, to give you an idea of the wrong product and the wrong type of use, because that's what we don't want. We don't want to choose the wrong type of internet connection for us if it's not something that we're going to use. Uh, there was a <laughs> there's a former customer of mine. Uh, he would always buy the cheapest of the cheapest of everything that he absolutely needed. He would not spend one penny more than he needed to. If there was something that he need for, needed for the business, he wouldn't care what the needs were. He would just buy the cheapest thing of that need. Okay, and uh, it was in the middle of summer. And he had this poor girl working in the uh, file room of his office. And this room was hot. There was no air conditioning in there. The vents of the building didn't go into this room. And uh, I was in there fixing a computer. I was sweating bullets. And I told him, hey, listen, you need to get some sort of air conditioner in here. Okay. You know, and, you know, if this if this girl gets a heat stroke while she's working in here, in here you know, she's going to come down on you. So, you know what he went out and did? Uh, maybe about a, maybe, maybe about a week later, I, I came back in there to finish up some work on the computer. And he had a uh, an evaporative cooler in the room. Okay. Now, for those of you that don't know what an evaporative cooler, I, I didn't know what it was first until I, uh, after I actually moved to Arizona from New York City. Evaporative coolers are not on the East Coast. Evaporative cooler is a type of cooling. It's kind of like an air conditioner. But instead of using compression and, uh, and uh, I, I don't know what the other side of that uh, of the air conditioner is called, but it doesn't use compression. An air conditioner uses uh, compression and uh, uh, th th there's this other side of it. Anyway, that, that it, it, uses, it uses mechanical uh, uh, devices inside using pressure in order to cool air and to pull heat out of the room and blow it out outside. Now, an evaporative cooler uses a different principle. What it does is it uses running water over pads, and the action of the water evaporating off of these pads for a moment makes it feel a little bit cool. Just like on a really, really, really hot day, if someone splashes water on your face, the uh, your face starts to feel cool not because the water is cool, but the, but the mere fact that it's evaporating off of your skin makes your skin feel cool. That's why we sweat. When you, if you're in a dry environment and you sweat, your, uh, your your skin starts to feel cool. Okay, it's that ev that it's that evaporative uh, uh, part that actually makes you feel cool. So that's the principle that these machines work on. So he went out. Now these these machi these machines are cheaper, slightly cheaper than air conditioners. This guy went out and he bought an evaporative cooler, which is designed for being outside. Okay, you cannot. These things will not work correctly if you have them indoors, and it has to be hot, and it has to be dry uh, when it's hitting these uh, these uh, pads on the inside while water is 
kind of trickling over them. Okay, long story short, I know, too late. Uh, he had this evaporative cooler in here trying to cool off this room. He turned on the water and it was barely cooler air coming out of this thing. And I, I, every time I went in there, I just wanted to like laugh. I couldn't stop myself from laughing because it is so stupid as to how much, uh, a little bit more effort into actually getting a real thing, the actual thing that he needed. It would not have costed him that much more, but he is just so cheap. So when it comes to internet, you really want to know what it is that you need. You don't want to buy the wrong thing. You don't want to buy something that is close to it. You don't want to get something that mimics it. You want to get the right thing for you. Here are some of the things that you need to consider uh, when uh, buying your internet service or looking into any type of internet service that you're trying to set up in your home. You want to look at how many users and how many devices. Again, how many users and how many devices. So users would be you, maybe the kids, the spouse. You also want to consider what type of uh, visitors, if, you should, if you're the kind of people that uh, have visitors over. And you also want to consider the number of devices. This includes phones, TVs tablets, laptops, desktops. If you have a security system, that would also count as a device. Anything that accesses the internet, any device that accesses the internet, you want to give each device and each device of every user in the house three to five megabits per device. And what that means is if, for example, if you have a smartphone and a TV, um, and a and a laptop, okay. Those that's three devices. So you would need somewhere in the ballpark of nine to fifteen megabits, okay. That's three to five megabits for each device. Now you can get a lot of data out of a out of just three to five megabits. For example, many of us know what Netflix is. You could actually watch a high definition Netflix movie, and it's only going to draw five megabits okay now some of the devices out there may be configured in such a way that it may hog more than five megabits but really it only needs maybe about five megabits to actually run uh, consistently a high definition movie okay so that's really all it needs now the internet companies they would want you to believe something else. They would want you to think, oh well, you have three devices. Oh, you must need 100 megabits. No, you don't need that much. You just need three to five megabits per device. Um, some of them, uh, again, the internet companies they'll say, well, you need 10 megabits per device or 15 megabits device per device. A lot of people don't realize how much data is actually. Uh, consumed into that three uh, into that three to five megabits. Three to five megabits is a lot. A lot can be done with three to five megabits. Uh, so you don't. So you want to make sure that you're calculating that uh, when you're thinking about how much speed that you have. And this is the part of the show where we talk about some of our frustrations that are technology related. Um, here's something to consider uh, when you're calling in to. Uh, for tech support <laughs> okay at some point when whenever you get your internet service you're gonna have to at some point call into tech technical support for some time and there's got to be a certain way that you got to you you got to talk to these people because it could be very very frustrating here's the frustrating part about it so you call the number you go to their IVR system that's where you gotta push one for English uh, press 2 for customer service, press 3 for billing, you know, you go through all these menus, right? Very, very frustrating. You got to do it every time. It really, let's be honest, we're all just looking to speak to a person, right? So uh, when you're speaking to these per people on the phone, once you get to them, you don't want to use too much of technical jargon. And what that means is if your computer for example, let's say it loses an internet connection and your computer says, you know, we're unable to uh, reach the internet that you've requested. Please uh, check your server for the other thing. See, now if you tell the rep 
to that you need to check your server settings okay that is going to take them on a branch of troubleshooting where they're actually put in the word server into their search query because all they're doing is they're just pulling up knowledge bases and they're just going to give you more information okay if you are just miss if you just lost your internet connection the very very simple thing to do is just to simply tell them I've lost my internet connection don't say anything about servers don't say anything about you know resetting anything don't tell them what you've done don't tell them you know the, just tell them you've lost your internet connection and wait for them to respond okay they know exactly the right questions you want to make sure that you end up in the right troubleshooting uh, case um, and th those things actually do work. The the uh, the knowledge bases that they have, that that uh, that ultimately you're going to find yourself in, they actually do work. But you have to make sure that you get there. If you use too much technical jargon, you're going to end up in the wrong place. You're going to be very very frustrated because you're going to be on the phone with them for hours and upon hours, and they are not going to know what you're talking about. You're going to get more confused. And it's not really their fault. They're just the call takers. They are not network engineers. And uh, I have a customer. <laughs> he loves to use technical jargon. And every time he has a problem with, uh, with his internet service provider, I get this long, long email. And I don't even know what it's talking about. He probably doesn't know what he's, what he's talking about in these emails. Okay. And ultimately, it all boils down to me going over to his house okay turn his computer on it says that it's not connected to the internet the internet light is off on the router I call the company I tell them hey we lost internet they they do some sort of reset or something and then the computer starts working okay some things are not as complicated as they may seem if you lost an internet connection just say that you lost an internet connection and avoid the frustrations this is the part in the show where we talk about a gimmick or not a gimmick. So, let's say that you've had your internet a while and you notice that the bill is getting higher and higher. I'm sure we've all experienced that, where we have an internet bill that seems to get higher and higher, and you're not imagining things. They are getting higher and higher. So, well, you decide to do this. You decide to call the internet service company, and you decide to find out what exactly you're getting for the money that you're paying. Now, here's where things get a little bit complicated and a little bit gimmicky, and you should be aware of this. If you have multiple services, which, which is perfectly fine, what I mean by multiple services, you may have internet service, you may have a cable TV service, uh, you may have a phone service, uh, most companies will call that a triple play. And let's say that your bill is starting to creep up and you say, you know what, I'm not really using my phone service. You know what, I'm going to try to lower my bill and I'm going to call them up. And I'm saying, I want you to take the phone service off of my account. Now, you would think that removing a service is actually going to lower your bill, but here's the gimmick. If you remove a service, you lose the triple play discount. Whereas now it's kind of like getting like a like a value meal at McDonald's. You know, <laughs> if you buy the ingre if you buy the uh, parts of the meal separately, you end up paying more. But if you buy them together, you pay less. So if you remove something from that deal, now you're paying full price for each item. And that's the same thing that how they do it with these triple plays with these internet service companies. So if you remove the phone service from your account, now you're going to start paying full serv full price for the internet service and for your TV. And the difference in price is usually about $10, $5, even maybe somewhere less than $20. And then the rep's going to be on the phone with you like, so do you really, really want to uh, stop this uh, service because it's only a $10 difference? And then you're like, oh, well, it's a film. if it's only $10 difference, I guess we'll just keep it on. And now you have in that gimmick. 
So how do we avoid this? Well, try to get all of your services to run on your internet. Try to get your phone. If you have a landline phone, you want to keep a landline phone, get a, uh, get a Google Voice box. Uh, OBI uh, makes one. It's O-B-H-I. I think it, no, O-B-I-A-H is the name of the box. You can buy them on uh, Amazon or eBay. It's a $50 box that'll give you one line or a $70 box that'll give you two lines. They work great. They work right off of Google Voice. Yes, Google Voice is still around. And they give you a great landline service. You buy the box once and you get free uh, a phone service for life. For the, uh, you know, I, I have some customers that have been using it for years. Uh, I have an OBI uh, box in my office. It runs two lines. I can fax from that line. I can talk on that line. It's a great line. So uh, that runs off my internet. As long as the internet is on, those phones work. So I don't have to pay for phone service through the uh, internet company. Same thing with TV. Find a way to get your TV through your internet, through a, uh, through a TV browser or a, a desktop that's hooked up to your big TV in your living room. Find some way to run your TV that way because you'll save money on your cable bill only by paying an internet bill. And this is what the internet companies, they want you to have, they want to sell you all these extra services. So they're, hang, they're hanging on, they're clinging on to the phone service, they're clinging on to the, uh, to the cable TV service. And uh, I, they're, they're calling them cable cutters because more and more people are starting to realize that they're, they can save money by doing internet TV and streaming. And that's the latest uh, technology of, of, uh, of watching TV, and that's what most people are starting to be going to. So don't fall for the gimmicks and be safer and save some money when you're dealing with these cable companies and these internet companies. Now, the last part of the show, we're going to go over things that they don't tell you. Now, here's something that they kind of spring on you. Of course, it's in the, you know, it's in that thick Bible of uh, terms and conditions that we all check the box and nobody ever reads. Um, here are some of the things that are in there. Uh, number one, they, they can run your credit. And, and this is kind of obvious uh, when you're starting up your service and they ask you for your social security number or they ask for uh, history information like previous addresses, uh, you know, names of relatives, things like that. They're matching you up with their, uh, with, with the public information that's out there. So they, they run your credit. So, uh, and they do this for, for their own reasons. And it, there's good reasons for it. Sometimes they will avail uh, products and service to you ahead of time before they've actually received payment. So most of the time they'll actually get you started before they've actually uh, 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 received any money from you. Okay, and they'll bill you later. They'll actually have like a whole installation of internet service in your house before you've actually paid anything. So they need to have some sort of recourse. So they, they take your uh, uh, credit information. And if your credit information is not good enough, if you don't have a good enough credit score, they're going to ask for some money up front, like a deposit of something that they just keep in their pocket uh, in case uh, they provide a service that they are never paid for. Uh, which bring, brings us to the next thing that they uh, don't tell you. They remember your debts for decades okay so if you move or if you cancel your service or ever stop your service make sure that you pay them and you get a zero balance letter back from them because they'll come back to you because at some point when you move or the next service uh, comes along or uh, you, you switch from one service that you don't like and you want to go back to them they're that that uh, debt or that remaining balance that's left in the negative, they're going to come back to you, okay? Because they're going to ask for your name again. They're going to try to match you up with all of the previous accounts as best as they can. And they're going to find out if you owe them money, if you try to come back to them, okay? So they don't tell you that, but they are relentless. They don't give up on these, on these old debts. 
The other thing that they don't uh, tell you is the the there. It seems to me, and I, <laughs> I. I can only talk from experience of me looking at my customers' bills and my bills. They always try to sneak things into the bill, um, hoping that you don't see. Uh, extra service charges, uh, rental of equipment that they've never installed, uh, services that you have never asked for, um, you know, will just show up on the bill. So make sure uh, you're looking at your bill either online or if, if you're not accustomed to doing things online, do not accept their uh, paperless option, okay? Because if you accept the paperless option, the only way that you can see your bill is if you log into your account from their website online. If you don't know how to do that, then you are cutting yourself off from looking at what you are being billed for. So you always want to have a system of looking at your bill every you don't have to do it every single month but you know every so often when when you got the pile we going through your bills or all of your uh, invoices and everything just just kind of just look at that itemized thing that they have uh, on there make sure that you're not being billed for something make sure you're not being double billed for something uh, they they're synonymous with doing this i don't know how they're getting away with it at some point hopefully uh, everyone that's been taken advantage of over the years We'll get some sort of payback for that. Uh, the other thing that they don't tell you is um, there's no checks and balances as far as getting the, the speed that you need. Uh, so they call it the World Wide Web because it is basically, if, if you were to look at the lines of uh, data transmission across the United States, it would look like a big web. There's so many different routes of ways to get around to uh, different uh, routers and computers and uh, web devices. So you can have a request go from one device. It can take one route and it the information will pass through that same route that it was requested. And then just one minute later, you can request to that same computer and it'll take a completely different route. Okay. So... Uh, when when things are, are routed, sometimes routers go bad, sometimes routers slow down, sometimes they heat up, sometimes they are designed to automatically uh, 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 power cycle themselves or shut down temporarily uh, in order to uh, fix issues and they're self-correcting issues. Now, uh, if that should happen to a router that is close to your house or the router that is directly connected uh, which is like the main uh, access point for the rest of the world just outside of your house. If that router goes bad, okay, it affects all the speed. And there's no alarm usually on those routers that tells the Cox, hey, this guy is paying for 100 megabits, but he's only getting 5 megabits. There's no alarm. So uh, very often you'll find out that you can be paying for 100 megabits speed, but you're only getting five megabits of speed. And so the way that you can check that is to do a speed test. There are lots of online speed tests. Google has a speed test. The, uh, the internet service providers are now starting to provide their own speed testers on their, uh, as, as uh, web tools on their website. Uh, there's this website called Ookla. I think it's O-O-K-L-A. Uh, they have a speed test, and uh, these speed tests, you, you, you load the site, you hit the button that says test speed, and immediately it gives you like this uh, RPM meter or this uh, uh, miles per hour meter type thing, like, like it looks like you're in your car, and it'll tell you how fast your internet is. And then you compare that to what your internet bill says. If your internet bill says that you should be getting 50 megabits, but you're only getting 2 megabits, which is, I've seen, it's, this actually happens more often than most people want to believe. But they do, uh, they do slow you down. And if you have slow internet, that's one of the things you want to check. If your internet has slowed down, the first thing you should do is power cycle your router Okay, let it boot up. It may take two to five minutes. If your speed doesn't uh, return uh, to the correct speed after that, then call your internet company and tell them that your speed is slow. 
and just say that. Just say that your internet is slow. I'm paying for this, but I'm only getting that. That's what you tell them. And then that's going to put them on to a, uh, a line of uh, questioning and uh, troubleshooting that will eventually, hopefully at the end, will result in you getting your speed back. The other thing that they don't tell you is uh, data limits. Uh, so data limits don't really come into play that much, but uh, it's uh, again, this is something that's buried, buried in the uh, terms and conditions of most of these. But it's something worth knowing that if you do a lot of downloads, like if, like if you have a teenager that likes to download a lot of music or download a lot of movies or download a lot of programs, uh, there is actually a data limit okay which is independent of the speed the, the speed is just how fast you get the data but the amount of data capacity is actually uh, is actually measured uh, automatically through your data plan and uh, most of the time the limits are outrageous like somewhat some somewhere in the ballpark of like a terabyte of data but uh, that, that, that data usage can actually start to creep up pretty fast if you're not watching it. And if you have people uh, that are connected to your internet that like to download a lot of things. Ironically, streaming does not, does not uh, uh, spike your data usage for some reason. Uh, I was doing some research on that as to why that is the case, but... Most of the time you can get away with, uh, with just streaming. You can stream all day long and it won't really affect your data limits. That is it, ladies and gentlemen, for this edition of Technology Frustrations and Gimmicks. If you found the information in this show to be helpful and informative, please share on your social media and leave a positive comment or question for a future episode. Technology Frustrations and Gimmicks is sponsored by Computer Doctor of Tucson. Computer Doctor of Tucson is a licensed desktop and laptop service and support center working on all makes and models of computers up to 20 years old. We also have a rent and rent to own program on laptop and desktop systems for families, schools, and businesses with tech support included. If you are having any computer issues, call our office at 520-261-5508 or visit our website at computerdoctor.xyz. Until then, See you next time.